thank you so much for coming today um, to this Authors at Google event. We're, we're really pleased to have you here. Um, I'm very pleased to introduce Michael Gates Gill. His new book is called How Starbucks Saved My Life. A son of privilege learns to live like everyone else. Um, I'll let Michael explain how exactly his life was saved. Um, I'm sure he'll do it more eloquently than I can. Um, but let me share some of the praise that's been given to this book. Thomas More, the author of The Worth of Our Work, writes that how Starbucks saved my life is based on the simple idea that down-to-earth, humbling labor can help you reorientate, reorient excuse me, your values and priorities and give you a new life. It will speak to anyone in need of radical surgery on their worldview, and that includes most of us. Sit down with a cup of coffee in this book and entertain yourself towards enlightenment. Please join me in welcoming Michael Gates Gill. Thank you. Great. So that's, that's a great introduction. You know, I, I always uh, was appreciative when I heard anyone speak of shortness. I never rushed up afterwards and said, I wish you'd talk longer. So Lisa, that was a great, perfect little introduction. But also, it's Lisa, Lisa shared with me that it's her you know, second year anniversary today uh, with, with uh, Google. So it's a big day for her. And I'd also like to say it's a big day for me because uh, I'm, I'm making a couple months book tour and I go to a, a many, you know, bookstores which I love, but also many cities. But coming to Google is, uh, is the high point. Uh, so I like to say yay, yay to all of you because you make my life so much more enjoyable and doable. And uh, I know everyone talks about like the ease and speed, but I talk about, or I like to share with you that to, for me it's a creative it's a creative door that you open, too, because the creativity is based on communications and information. And no, no one can create without that. And, uh, you know, I was a history of art major, so I studied the Lasco cave paintings, you know, where they began to communicate with each other. I mean, that's our primal, I think, human uh, desire and need and excitement is that idea of communicating. And I think all of you in this room, well, it's just an integral part of my life. But it's so great to see it brought to life and to be at your campus, this beautiful campus on this spectacular day. And I just want to say how grateful I am, how grateful I am to be here and for all your hard work everyone in this room does to help me and everybody. And, you know, I think the fact that it's become such a part of my life, everybody's life, it is a verb, you know. I'll Google it, I'll say, you know, right? I mean, that no, that's like, you know, the, I'll print it or whatever. I mean, it, be, it becomes a, such an essential part of any creative person's life. Uh, you know, so you've, you've achieved a great thing. You every day, I know that you probably hear some of this, but I just wanted to recognize how, what a, a major part you play in every creative person's life at any, at any time of the day that you might even not be aware of. But you probably are in a general sense, but I wanted to make it specific. The other reason I'm grateful to be here today is about four years ago now, I was uh, diagnosed with a brain tumor, you know, by one of these uh, eager uh, brain surgeons. And... Uh, he was so eager to operate, and he said, you know, you're one of those very rare percentage of people that get this thing. He was excited by it, you know, and he said, actually, it's my specialty. He wanted to show me the articles he'd written about it. And I said, well, you know, I, I just, I, I immediately said, I wasn't so eager for the operation, and secondly, I didn't have health insurance at the time, you know. And so he lost a little bit of his enthusiasm, and four years later, I'm still negotiating. He calls it watchful waiting. I, I call it fear and trembling. I don't want to go under the knife. It's so medieval. Talk about the old days of the printing press. All stuff. That, that's the old days. They have to actually still bore into your skull. So I'm grateful also just to be alive, you know, right here, right now. And then secondly, that was one of the shocks that uh, led me to uh, this, this story, really. Uh, a couple of weeks before I walked in the Starbucks store, I had that diagnosis, and then also my life, I was 63 at the time, uh, now I'm 67, but at that time, my life had been, you know, sort of going downhill. Uh, I'd been given everything in life, really. I'd been, you couldn't imagine a more uh, bountiful birth in the sense that uh, I've been born into affluence, and my father, Brendan Gill, was a famous uh, and very great writer at the New Yorker magazine, and the New Yorker magazine in those days, this is even before Google, was the place people looked for great writing. And so it was, I, you know, I knew all the famous people of the day from Jackie Kennedy, Norman Mailer, all the famous writers uh, of that time. And I was in that world, uh, which they called it like the glitterate, and it was a glittering uh, atmosphere. And then growing up in that affluent thing, uh, I see you've got a thing from Yale on the wall. 
And I was also given a Yale education. In those days, if your father, grandfather, and great-grandfather's mind had gone to Yale, the, op the door was open. There was no rigorous competition. It was just obvious that you could go. I mean, if you had to have an open checkbook as well. But, but it's, uh, it's, uh, it's amazing how things have changed in that way. But in my time, as I said, I was given that gift of education. And then a friend of mine from college gave me a job at J. Walter Thompson, which is the biggest advertising agency in the world at the time. And, uh, but he just, because he was working at uh, a big uh, uh, Pan American Airlines, which at that time was the biggest airline in the world, and they were the biggest client or big client, it was sort of a, a series of gifts. But uh, I made the big career mistake in advertising of uh, growing old. That is really, that's, uh, that's one thing you're not allowed to do. So I, I, you know, in a naive way, I thought, well, if I'm loyal, hard work, but you know, it was stupid. You're never really that exceptional. So at 53, I was sort of invited to have breakfast off campus, if you will, off uh, site, which don't, never go to a meal like that. It's like the mafia. Never, never, never take that invitation. Because, <laughs> uh, you know, and then we were, I was told, we have to let you go. And uh, unintentionally, I love that phrase, let you go, because they were letting me go. I didn't realize it at the time. And by the way, you, couldn't, you can't complain. In corporate life, it is like the mafia again, too. It's the vow of silence. You can never complain anyone's treated you badly, because your next move, your next job, then will be impossible. You'll be professionally dead. So I set up, a lot of people do at that time, a consulting, quote unquote, business. And for a couple of years, it went well. But then gradually, no one answered my, my calls. And you can imagine in this room how terrifying it is to have silence, silence at the other end of the phone call. But I was still pretending. I'd still dress up in a suit and tie. Yes, that's what we do in the East Coast when we're pretending to be successful. Isn't it bizarre? But that's still the culture today. If you went to New York City today, the people that think of themselves as the master of the universe still put on a necktie. And there's no reason for a necktie, no functional reason. It's pure fashion. But that was still the fashion. So I'd still do it in a kind of magical, if I dress up in this Brooks Brothers suit and carry this briefcase and pretend like I'm making calls. And, and uh, you know, many of us, when, when we have hard times, we go back to happier memories. And I went back to the memory of my youth when I was this fortunate son. And, you're living on East 78th Street in New York, which is a nice area with a nice uh, brownstone, uh, old brownstone. And uh, I saw that there was a, a Starbucks store there. And I said, well, at least I'm going to have a latte. I was also broke. I'd been divorced, so, and the brain tumor. So I had a series of sort of a, a, a series of perfect storm, almost hard, hardships on me. And, the, and most the hardest hardship was myself. Because I had been given everything, I had no real way to move towards a new life. You know, I, I didn't really know how to get out of that box. I couldn't call for help because I was still in that cocoon of sort of self-entitlement. I didn't know how to wave for, even ask for help. There's a great poem by a woman named Stevie Smith. It says, I was further out than you thought, and not waving, but drowning. And you know, in life, sometimes you're, you're in desperate need, but you can't really, and, other, and you still have to smile. How are you? Everyone says, fine, no matter what you're feeling. I was in that state of, a frozen, a frozen state, and yet I was declining, I was, I was failing, and I didn't know how to ask for help or get out of that box I'd, I'd put myself in. So I went into Starbucks, that, you know, latte, I'll have a latte and feel better, and I happened to go into a store that was having what they call a hiring event. Managers from all over the city would come in to hire people, and I happened to sit down next to this young, attractive woman, and, and she, she turned to me and she said, uh, you know, as after I sat down, would you like a job? And suddenly, you know, that broke through this... Uh, the sort of screen I'd set up. I said, I realized, yeah, I would like a job. And then she said, well, fill out this application. I said, whoa, 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 I need help. So I was also in that moment, there was just something, I guess I was desperate enough because it wasn't courage, it was just desperation because I knew that I couldn't fill out a job application. I never had in my life, had to, and I, I, I would fail. So I said, well, I need your help to do it. She said, okay, so I moved over across from her. And by the way, she was the kind of person from a no education background, who grew up on the streets of New York, made her own way, was now manager of a Starbucks store, but, but without any of my advantage, to, a totally different person, decades younger. And I can say completely honestly and sadly, I would never have reached out for her. I would never have helped her make that transition. I mean, when I was interviewing people and we would, for example, have a minority program, I would say, this is not gonna work. People without a education in the Ivy Leagues, without these things, they can't do it. And guess what? My prophecy would always come true because of that, my attitude that only the people like me from my background with my education could be a, a, make a contribution. But she had a, 
she had a more generous spirit. And so she reached out for me and she said, okay, let's go through this. You know, have you got any retail experience? And I said, well, well what is retail? Or, you know, her, so she, but she took the next step. She said, well, like Walmart. I said, well, I've never been in a Walmart. And she said, well, and then yeah, I, I thought I was going to lose her. So I desperately was thinking, well, I'd written some mission statements from Burger King. So I said, well, I worked with Burger King. She said, Burger King, okay, we'll put that down. <laughs> so in other words, you know, she was on my side. She was going to help me from the silent uh, death that I was going through. And that was such a miracle. I mean, that is a, not a minor miracle in the way that my life was saved at that moment. And it's those little, you know, interactions in life, those accidental, spontaneous interactions, which I'd been, I think, almost fro too frozen to engage in. But she broke through and did that. And then she went, as we went through it, she also said, well, by the way, you know, how many children do you have? And I said, five. She said, whoa, you've been busy. In other words, for her, it was a sense of humor. In her life, later I learned her mother died of a drug overdose. She'd been put over to an aunt. In other words, an extended family. Having five kids was nothing. And that was a relief to me, too, because I was in that guilty feeling, too, that how do I support them? They don't. And she said, Starbucks, even for a part-time employee, which I was going to be, she said, they'll completely cover uh, insurance for all your children. Whoa. So instead of just saying, maybe this job, I said, really, this is the job for me. Anyway, she she called me a couple weeks and said, okay, you know, show up for work at 93rd and Broadway. And that's what was way across town. And you, if you know New York, 93rd and Broadway is like a different world. It's a very tricky neighborhood. That could be, and I never gone there. So I said, whoa, I thought you worked at 78th Street, you know, the east side. And she said, yeah, I, I don't work there. I just came over to hire people. And so my store, if you want to work for me, do you want to work at that kind of thing? So I showed up there, and, but I was, I was feeling worried, and, you know, uh, uh, the dream, uh, my dream had never been to wear a green apron and a black baseball cap and serve coffee, you know? So I was worried and sort of humiliated and, and as I came in that door, but she, uh, her name was Crystal. She came over to me right away, sat me down, gave me some delicious coffee. It's called Sumatra. It was really delicious. And she gave me some espresso brownies. I've always loved brownies. And, and the, uh, by the way, I hear you have delicious food here. So I'm going to stay for some of it. But it's certainly... What, you know, in all my years, uh, my 26 years at j I never even imagined, ever thought of bringing coffee to anyone who worked for me. You know, and right away, my first day, and she's sitting across the table, and we're chatting, we're, we're enjoying those moments. Once again, it's a very busy retail environment. It's a kind of scene you would never expect that the person running this whole thing can take that time to just engage on a personal level on the first day, because... In many companies, they say first day orientation, all stuff, but a lot of times you're just thrown in. And is there that, from the person who is at the top of it, if you will, that kind of consideration, just a personal consideration. So I knew I was a little bit different world. And then I looked around the uh, store, though, and I, then I was a little bit worried because originally I thought this job might be beneath me, right? My elevated ex education and everything. And then I realized you know, they were these 20-somethings, they were calling out drinks, doing the register, you know, with all these complicated things. And I realized this might be beyond me. I was never much of an athlete. My hearing was affected by this uh, brain tumor. And uh, I, was, I was feeling like, gosh, you know, it's one thing to be fired by J. Walter Thompson, another thing to be fired by Starbucks. And I was well on my way to thinking I couldn't make it. And then she introduced me to this, this person who came in wearing, what do you call it, that dewlap and very formidable looking uh, uh, man. Uh, you know, in his 20s, but he looked, you know, he's the kind of person I would have crossed the street to avoid in my previous life. And he came and, uh, and Crystal said, hey, Kester, come over here. And he brought, brought him over the table and he said, you know, I, I'm going to, uh, I'm, Kester, you're going to be uh, Mike's coach, Mike's co training coach. And Kester gave me this big smile. And, you know, that was a turning point, too, because he was, he believed I could do it. So he, he believed and he made it, made it true. So just to make it very, very short, all those different things that I never thought I could do, like calling out drinks. By the way, I'm not still the perfect person at any of this stuff. But they did believe I could do it, and I did, was able to make that, that move across, across the bar. And working with these partners from all these different backgrounds also restored my faith in the idea that, it's, it, you know, in other words, if I hadn't had this experience, I would have probably ended up somewhere, you know, a country club somewhere saying, People of different races and cultures and backgrounds and religions and education experience can never work together. And yet it happened on every shift. It happened with two or three people needing each other to be successful. We needed e each other. We needed each other to be successful, whether it was putting out pastries or coffee or doing all those thousands of things that make for an enjoyable experience. 
The other revolutionary thing I discovered was, because I'd worked with many Fortune 500 companies, and most of them say we put our customers first. And Starbucks puts their partners first. In other words, they, before you, you know, just like sitting down with a cup of coffee with me, but also in addition, training and, and you know, all the health benefits. And in addition to that, the idea that you, know, you get stock right away, I mean, after 30, uh, 90 days or something, and stock options, and you, become a, you literally become a partner as a part-time person. See, that's the revolution, part-timers. Isn't that unbelievable? I mean, these are people who just, there's a flow of partners in and out, right? But they're taken in and given all the facilities, all the resources that you might not get as a senior executive in corporate America. And I know that's not true for Google, but it's true in many corporations. So it's that respect. And even, even day by day, there's that respect for, like, it could be a line out the door, or busy, and someone spilled coffee, and Crystal would turn to me, and she'd say, Mike, could you do me a favor? Now, my previous life, say a client says, we need three commercials by Monday, and it's Friday night. I'd run down the hall and say, we're working this weekend. A kind of macho you know, excitement that we're going to sacrifice our lives to get these commercials done. And instead, just that few moments, I mean, it's not a question even in now of cost and, and benefits and stock. It's a really question of a few seconds of saying, would you do me a favor? Recognizing me as a person that... And, and just engaging in those few moments of, of we're humans and we're individuals. For example, when, after I've been there some months and I could help other people, I had this uh, class on how to coach. And they said, everybody learns differently. So don't worry about how you learn. Don't try to impose that. Try to find out how they learn, like it's by reading or visuals or doing. And I never learned that in my previous corporate life. It was always like, here's the way you learn. So it was a whole individualization too. And that was also played out with the customers that they call guests. Because you know it didn't seem to make sense when I first got behind the register and they would come up and, and guests would say, Aventi, I think, is that big or grande? Or, I said, why are they making it so hard for people to order a drink? Because in my previous life in advertising, you say, make it as easy as possible for people to buy something, right? And it seemed like we were making it so hard for them. I said, Americans don't like foreign languages, you know? This is a foreign language, cappuccino, all these things. And yet, as I worked there over the weeks, I discovered that, first of all, the guests would come in very uptight, and then their faces would be, but they, as they tried to order these drinks, and they say venti with, you know, two shots of sugar-free vanilla and all the specialty things. And most, I would say 90% of the companies in America don't want you to order your own little special customized thing. They want you to one, two, or three, a cookie cutter approach. So here was Starbucks doing something totally different. Each individual was encouraged to make their own drink just the way they liked it. But you know what a powerful, powerful excitement that was. You can only, you can only even for everybody from different places, I saw them come in and they, they, as they went through this process and they say, okay, double tall, Non-fat lot, okay, double toe, non-fat lot. It was almost become a song, but they heard a call back two or three different times, and they knew in this aspect of their life, in many aspects of their life, beyond their control. Many, you know, like a young mother came and said, this is the one time in my day where I get things just the way I want it, you know? That's satisfaction. And then also, it's the way you got to know your guests. Because they would say, oh, I can't, you know, say this, uh, you know, a pregnant woman would say, I, I have to have decap, but oh, now I can have folk. You know, in other words, you engage in that dialogue. It's participatory create, creating. And you say, well, what are you creating? I mean, I, my previous job was called a creative director at an advertising agency. And what I was creating was sort of, you know, different ways of manipulating words and people. But what I'm creating now at Starbucks in creating these drinks and just those moments of enjoyment, I think in some way, I don't want to be too pretentious or pompous about it, but I think in some ways, at least for myself, it's much more satisfying because it's so rare, those little moments of enjoyment, those little moments of you are special and we're, we're going to have a good time together. The smile, the laughter, and that whole music, the whole thing that comes together. So when I leave a shift, and by the way, the great gift, I shouldn't tell you this because I know you, how hard everyone in this room works, the part-time job for a full-time life. Because in America, we always say, you know, we define ourselves by our work rather than define ourselves by our lives. And this is not true of many civilizations, but it's true of ours. Now, it goes back to the Puritan ethic, and I could do a riff for a very long time about that, where they said, the devil makes work for idle hands, and they described anything idle as not doing. And because they were our founders, you know how powerful founders are in the culture of any company, 
It's true of a country. And you'll be, in one way, it was great. They were, in, Engl- they were from England, they were at Cambridge, and Oxford professors who said, everybody reads. Everybody reads. That was a revolution. Because everybody has their own way to understand the Bible, right? So that's why in little New England villages, you have a church and a school. And it was mandatory that everybody, men and women, to- totally egalitarian about that. But in, it was an intellectual focus. And that was all great. But then I think that the Puritan ethic of saying that anything, you know, if you were even sleep, they were terrified. The easy, early uh, ministers would talk against sleeping too much. <laughs> See, so it was, it, I think anything gets unbalanced. This is a long way of saying that defining yourself purely through work. So I get up at 4 a.m. in the morning. At 67, I'm sort of staggering out of bed. I still hurt, et cetera. I go there by 5, but then I have a few cups of coffee with my partners and the guests, and it's enjoyable. And those, I, we're creating together those moments of enjoyment. And when I leave at 1, I, I feel great because guess what? The rest of the afternoon, evening, night is mine. I can go home. I can you know, listen to music. I can play with my kids. I can read a book. I would never have been able to write this book without that wonderful, luxurious expanse. In other words, my life was given back to me. So I'm happier today than than I can tell, not just by, I have to say I'm happier today being here. I I feel it's a great, I'm congratulating myself on this great achievement. What a miracle in my life that through this circuitous circumlocution, I've arrived at Google on such a beautiful day and to be able to thank you, and I really am grateful for that. But more than that, I, I came out of Starbucks one night after mopping the floor and cleaning. By the way, I became the best bathroom cleaner, if you're wondering what specialty became really good. I could make any bathroom sparkle. And it was so therapeutic in a time in my life where I didn't feel I was useful for anything. And Crystal will come, see, no one has ever cleaned a bathroom. You should never see anyone do better. So, you know, it's a peculiar thing. I probably hard for you to believe, but at some points in your life, just that feeling of usefulness can be happiness. And that's one, but the other thing was, I was so relieved when I, I went out into that West Side Street, uh, which is oh, still tricky, but it was late at night, but I said, you know, I'm happier than I've ever been. And part of that was having that, your life back, but part of that was finding some useful thing I could do. Part of that was creating enjoyment for, for others. But I think another big part of it was that big superstructure of achievement and status and big houses. Whew, what a relief. I go back to a little, uh, my little uh, converted attic, which is my apartment. And by the way, a New York Times interviewed me in the attic and this, uh, Joyce, this reporter, she said, I gotta stop being a reporter. This is, this is unacceptable, you've gotta get a couch. Because what I did is I have two, uh, two plastic, uh, white plastic uh, you know, uh, chairs, picnic chairs and a picnic table. And, you know, but they only cost $5 and the picnic table cost like 15 So I furnished my dining room, if you will call it. There's a one room with a kitchen and bedroom. But I finished it so spartan. And the walls are white. And there's not a lot of stuff. There's not a couch. You know, she said, just to get a couch against that wall. But if I got a couch against the wall, I'd pile it with papers. I'd fill it with stuff. And it's such a relief. I can't describe to you the relief not having the physical stuff and all that mental stuff and strain. And by the way, I would have never discovered this because I thought I was happy in my previous life of status and title and expense account and traveling and all that stuff. I thought I was happy, but it's nothing like the happiness I feel now without it. So my new life, and I think if reading the story, I hope you enjoy the story, but if you, if you read it, I think the, the only thing I would, and I'm not a guru about life or management or companies or anything, and it's not really about Starbucks, but it's like, well, you know, when Tom Hanks called after this book was uh, accepted for a publication, what apparently, and by the way, when I say he called, I don't mean that I know him or whatever, but apparently what appealed to him about doing the story, because he's going to play me in the movie, what appealed to him about the story was the idea that you can have an unsuccessful life like mine, or I would say probably his would be successful, obviously, but there can be a whole new chapter that you never imagined. You know, in America, how we like to plan out marketing and this and that that you never imagine that through a spontaneous, accidental turning, you can just step into this whole new world, and that new world you'll be happier than you've ever been, doing something you never imagined. I think that's the key. And I think I guess that's the only lesson out of my story that other people could, could uh, enjoy and maybe share, which is when you're feeling like you're stuck in any box, for whatever reasons, if it just doesn't feel good, and you don't see any rational way to think your way or analyze your way out of it, 
I, you know, just leap, leap to a, something totally new, unexpected, crazy, uh, humiliating, foolish, stupid, great, whatever. But just to put yourself in that new position. Because what I've discovered is that by just making that leap out of the box, you can find happiness that you never found before. Well, thank you very much. Thank you for being here. And uh, once again, I'm so happy to have shared these moments with you. And if you have any questions, uh, please ask them into the mic. Hi, yes. No, did, did, you, did, you, did I need permission from Starbucks? No, uh, that's another bizarre thing. You know, I mean, obviously, I told my manager my store, and she told you know, corporate and all this stuff that I was working on this book. But the word back was, will we encourage partner creative efforts? And she said, well, I said, well, go. that seems pretty relaxed. Because in my previous life, you know, if I told anyone, they'd say, I want to see every word and make sure. But uh, she said, well, you know, they're baristas. I'm a barista. She said, they're baristas all over America creating CDs and artwork and and Starbucks, and just uh, before I came out here, there was a memo saying, would anybody, in, in the, any partner like to write a song for Starbucks? So they're continually encouraging this, and they're so relaxed about it. I did, they didn't see a word before it was published. And by the way, there's some stuff I've heard from partners that they, like I refer to it as a double tall skim latte, and they said, you should say non-fat. So I mean, I'm sure there are lots of stuff, but it's amazingly relaxed, isn't it? To say, go ahead, you know, we believe in creative efforts without saying, well, we want to see every word and you know, that kind of thing. But uh, I, I feel so grateful to be in that kind of situation. It is a creative, you're all working in a creative experience. And believe it or not, creating these uh, things are also creative. But no, they, they didn't. Uh, I, and also, I didn't want to share with them. Because in my previous life, I, not, I noticed once you get into a corporate digestive system with words, you know, it's almost like anything, any English goes in, it comes out mush. What's the polite way of saying you could, well, anything? It doesn't come out better, you know, and because the best people in the world would add five good ideas, right? And then pretty soon that sentence of English it becomes gobbledygook, corporate speak. And I knew I couldn't do that because all I and I didn't want to tell a story of Starbucks. I wanted to tell my story truly as I could. And it could be. It doesn't have to be someone leaping out of a old life into a new life and going to Starbucks. Obviously, it could be anything. It happened to be Starbucks with me. Yeah, yes, sir. Uh, I, guess yeah. just, I guess this is kind of an unwitting follow-on to the previous question, is that with your uh, 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 success uh, uh, as an author and a book tour and a movie coming out, are you uh, worried about getting promoted or anything happening to your current yeah, job? That's a good question. <laughs> I, I'm still, still, I should say the other day, for example, this woman came in and she said, you know, I want a grande, you know, two pumps of sugar-free vanilla, you know, uh, extra hot, no foam latte. So I was getting that extra hot, no foam, and the two pumps of vanilla, and I gave it to her, and a few seconds later she came back and said, Mike, I think something's missing from the drink. I, I said, what? Coffee. I forgot to drop the espresso. So, no, no one's come up to me and say you should be promoted. You know, there's shift supervisor, <laughs> there's manager, the, and I think also I made myself, uh, uh, you know, obviously I, I've stumbled across a happiness I'd never known, right, with my, what you might call a smaller life rather than the bigger life. And I, I, I uh, obviously I'm not going to, I want to continue work for Starbucks. I mean, it's a perfect balance for me. And I, I don't plan to make any changes in that happiness because I'm worried that it is mysterious when you're happy, right? One day you're walking and you say, whoa, I'm really happy. Why? Yeah, you never really know maybe. And I, I just don't want to change any of the elements in it. Is there any other, by the way, I'll stay and sign books and answer questions as long as I, I tell Lisa, I, you know, this is the high point of my book tour, so I didn't schedule anything for this afternoon, except, you know, hopefully I'll get some food. Uh, but I'm, so I'll stay as long as anyone here would like to. But I'll have one more question, because I, I knew uh, the other thing uh, in my previous life in school, by the way, I never graduated from Yale. This was a decision fueled more by drink than by uh, rationality. But I thought everyone was going for degrees. So my senior year, I gave the cla class oration, or whatever it was called, you know, the commencement address. But I didn't take the degree. And also, that allows me to go back. I want to be the oldest undergraduate at some stage of my life. But let me take one more question, and then, uh, I'll, as I said, I'll, I'll be happy to sign and, and talk as long as possible. But yes? Yeah, um, one question, which is half related, half unrelated. 
Um, yeah, I was really happy to hear that how Starbucks treats the employees here and call them partners and whatever. But I was uh, looking through the marketing brochure the other day and I was a bit surprised that still only a small percentage of the coffee they buy is fair trade coffee. So don't, I don't know. I, I would feel that this, this happiness which was given to you could yeah. be given to other people as well and maybe the employees should make an effort to make that more than 20, 30 percent to make that 100 percent so people don't live on less than a dollar today, a day and they can send their p kids to school as well. And I wonder if there's any initiatives from the employees coming. Well, that, that's, a good, that's a good idea. By the way, yeah, I'm not a spokesman for, for Starbucks. You understand. Yeah, I know that. That's <laughs> but, why but, I'm saying no, that, maybe that, you should do a bottom-up okay. approach for okay, that. Okay, that, that, that might be a good idea because I, uh, I know that they work closely with you know, farmers and do all that stuff. But also, if you uh, email Starbucks or whatever it is, you, you, I think that's a good idea too. Cause, but I will definitely put my, my uh, little uh, voice into it as well. But anyway, thank you again, everybody, for, for, for having me here. Thank you.